Amen, amen. Uh, before we start this morning, we always like to welcome our Facebook viewers. Appreciate you tuning in and being part of our services. I uh, want to recognize those with birthdays and anniversaries coming up this week. On birthdays, on the 12th, we have Faith Farr, Dean Wade, Hagen Hauk. Hey. Amen. 13th, Lonnie Robinson. 17th, Dusty Farr. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Anniversaries on the 13th, Scott and Lisa Graham. Any birthdays or anniversaries coming up, we didn't get called off. Sing birthday and anniversary song, then. Happy, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. Happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary, God bless you, happy anniversary to you, and many more. Amen. Uh, this Wednesday night we have services at 7 o'clock. Brother Lou's going to bring the message. Uh, you come be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday will be our Covered Dish Fellowship. Uh, bring a covered dish and after the service stay for a time of a meal and a time of fellowship. Uh, all will also want to remind you we're taking certain precautions, COVID steps, the distancing, uh, one person in the bathroom at a time, uh, the mask, if you'd like to have one, washing the hands. So be respectful of each other on that. Some people just think there's nothing to it. Others want to be cautious and just re be respectful to one another. Uh, Eddie Crowley has been in nursing home for several months now, and it's one of those things the government deal is if you a certain length, they only do physical therapy for a certain length of time, and that run out, so... They're having to go and do some other stuff, but he's getting real close to being able to go home, and it's costing some money. Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. For him to have to stay there, so they're having some fundraisers, and some of his friends have gotten together, and uh, they've got a pair of bits and a saddle pad that they're selling chances on and to help raise funds for Eddie. And uh, the bits, they're uh, Kerry Kelly bits, and then there'll be a saddle pad. It's a t one ticket for 25 five tickets for 100 the first drawing will be for the bit, the second for the saddle blanking, and the drawing is going to be on October the 30th. Uh, Kelly Odell is back here at this table at the end of the service. If you'd like to buy a chance, two or whatever, you get with her, she'll take care of that. Or if you don't want a chance, you just want to donate. I don't care if it's a dollar, two dollars, whatever, it'd be appreciated. So be sure and, and help there, help a brother Christian. Uh, Eddie's a good Christian man. Amen. And he, he's, uh, you know, some people just, Lay there and don't try to help themselves. <coughs> Eddie's trying to do everything he can to get out of there, so we just need to get in there and support him on that. Uh, next Sunday, we've got a guest speaker. Tim Ross is going to come, and he'll do the message for you. Offering, don't take up an organized offering. Have a leather can church house at that for you. Leather can to bookcase there. Have the Lord lead you in that direction. Uh, we had services yesterday for a, a precious brother that went to be with the Lord, Jerry Humphrey, and appreciate all those that came, brought food, helped serve, helped usher people i know it was very well appreciative and uh, he just a precious brother you know I, sandy told me the first time i talked to her she said i'd give anything to see the look on his face when he crossed over this morning and i thought you know that that's right too <laughs> so like i say keep her in your thoughts and your prayers uh this is band sunday uh brother don and them uh they're having to al he, he'd been quarantined with covid so they're having to stay close to home Oh, yeah. Tonight is the countywide praise service. And they're going to do it here at the church. It'll be at 6 o'clock. And the different churches in the county, every year the Sunday before Pioneer Reunion get together and they sing. Each church, I think, sings two songs. we got a couple of our young ladies, Ashley yeah. and Delaney, will sing tonight. Also, it's going to be on Facebook. So if you want to view it, uh, be sure and tune that in. But if you get a chance, come here tonight, and I know you'll enjoy it. It's a good time of fellowship. Good morning, everybody. 
Now well, I'm going to uh, a spring a little something on our singers up here. Oh. I've got a song I want them to help me with today. They hadn't had a chance to practice, but I know they know this song. So we'll get to that one in just a minute. Uh, Brother Larry was talking about Jerry going home. Yeah. I miss that guy already. <coughs> the thing about Jerry... He was my prayer partner. I don't know if y'all seen this on Facebook or not. <coughs> he came to me a few months ago, and we talked together and everything, and he said, I want you to help me where I can pray when I'm in the need of something. And I said, okay. I said, we'll do this deal. We'll call it rolling. I don't care what it is. You don't tell me what your problem is. You just put on ro rolling on your Facebook page, and I'll roll it back to you. And then we'll tell the rest of our prayer partners is what we're doing. And that's the way that prayer group got started was with Jerry. I don't care what was going on or what time of day it was. I could put something in there and say, Roland, Jerry. And he would answer within 10 minutes. And it would say, Roland, and he would pray with me. He didn't ask me what my problem was or what was going on. He just says, I'm standing with you in faith. Because we based that on that verse in there that God says we're two or more get together yeah. I am there with you well he's not here physically but he's here Amen. Jerry and I weren't there physically but we were there and we could talk to each other like that I'm missing that guy for that I know I've got a whole bunch of you out there that are doing the same thing you've, you've known my story and you're part of our rolling group so if you see rolling on there sometime just say, God, we're with him. We're praying for him for whatever's going on. If I see you put rolling on there, I know you're asking for prayer too. So that's the way that group got started, and that was a Jerry Humphrey thing. I'll give him credit for that and give God credit for it. It has touched many, many people, and I'm so thankful that he was there to do that. And I loved him for it, and I do miss him. But <coughs> saying that, that's what got me thinking about what I was going to do for a service this morning. So I want to start off with my favorite. <coughs> it's the one that Kelly Jean and I met over. And it's a happy thing for me, but it also tells the story of my life. And it's Secret Place. <coughs> mm. You know, a heart is like a house. One day I let the Savior in. For there were many rooms. Where we could visit now and then One day he saw the door I knew the day had come too soon I said, Jesus, I'm not ready For us to visit in that room There's a place in my heart Even I don't go Got some things in there I didn't want no one to know But he handed me the keys Tears of love on his face He said, I want to make you clean Let me in your secret place So I opened up the door And the two of us walked in I was so ashamed His light revealed my hidden sin When I think about that room now I'm not ashamed anymore For I know my hidden sin no longer lies behind that door There's a place in my heart Even I don't go Got some things in there I didn't want no one to know But he handed me the keys Tears of love on his face 
He made me clean. I let him in my secret place. He made me clean. I let him in my secret place. If you all would, get you up here. I'm going to spring this on them. They, they don't know. <laughs> this was one of my favorite songs when I was growing up as a kid in church. <coughs> How Great Thou Art. If you all need a book, you can get one right quick. <coughs> my grandmother on my mama's side used to love this song. And <laughs> we always had big pickings on the weekends as part of our entertainment and everything. And this is always the one that she asked for. And I know everybody knows it. And if you all know it, just sing right along with us. But <coughs> this is one that really touched me, made me think about this when I heard Jerry had passed because I'm sure this is what he was doing. Oh Lord my God when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand have made I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, when through the wood. Glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. But when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died. 
to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, when Christ shall come, with a shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow. In humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great. You know, with all the stuff that our country's going through, we need to stay in prayer Amen. for everyone involved, all of us. <coughs> I'd like, if you all would, to stand for this one, please. <coughs> this is for our country. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the ocean white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains, from the mountains to, the prairie, to the prairie, to the ocean, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet. Let's go to prayer right quick. Father God, we thank you so much for holding us in your hand, Father. For the times that we're walking through, for the comfort and joy and peace that you give to us, Father, we thank you for that. We know you're still there. We know that if we turn to you, that you will have us, Father. We ask you for forgiveness for where we failed you, and we just ask that you take us and, and hold us close by father we ask you now to come bring your spirit into this place and drive everything else out father open our eyes and our ears and let us hear what you've got to say father 
let us take it to heart. If there's just one today that doesn't know you, Father, that they'll turn and come to you, Father. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your kindness, and we ask you to go with us throughout the rest of our service now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Children can be dismissed for Children's Church, 339, 339. Intermediate class can also be dismissed at this time. Rest of you, if you would, turn your Bibles to Isaiah 58, 59, Jeremiah 5, Matthew 7, James 5, 1 John 1. Proverbs 28, Isaiah 58, 59, Jeremiah 5, Matthew 7, James 5, 1 John 1. While you're doing that, we've started that we pray the 91st Psalms over our congregation, over each other every Sunday. I want to encourage you, each one of you to do it over yourself and your household. It's one of the best defenses you'll have against coronavirus. And I was talking to a guy the other day. And uh, he's requiring his teenage daughter to memorize it. That's a pretty neat deal. Pretty neat deal. But I, re I recommend for everybody to memorize it. But so let's pray this morning. I want you to repeat after me and make it personal whenever you're praying it for yourself or for your loved ones. Okay. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, You're my refuge, my fortress, my God, and in you will I trust. Surely you will deliver me from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. You understand that coronavirus falls right in that category? He shall cover us with his feathers. Under his wings shall we trust. His truth shall be our shield and buckler. We will not be afraid. For the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that comes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at our side, ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come nigh us. Only with our eyes shall we behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because we have made the Lord our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation, there shall no evil befall us, neither shall any plague come nigh our dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over us to keep us in all their ways. They shall bear us up in their hands, at least we dash our foot against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the dragon shall we trample underfoot. Because we've set our love upon God, He will deliver us. He will set us on high because we've known His name. 
We shall call upon him, and he will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor him. With long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. <clears throat> when it says in there that he placed angels in charge of you, do you understand that you have the right to ask angels to protect you as you come in, to keep people away from you that have the coronavirus? Amen. They're sent as ministering spirits to the people of God. <clears throat> so you can tell your angels, angels, protect me from people who come in contact with people with coronavirus. Saying that, uh, Steve Neese came in my office this morning, and uh, we've got a young man in, in uh, COVID section up at United Regional, Jeff Casper, and uh, Steve had taken him a prayer cloth, and uh, the nurses and others began to see him, want to know what they were. Uh, well, the nurses take care of him, he just give her his, you know. By, bottom line is, everybody in the COVID area up there, they want prayer cloths, <laughs> you know. So what we're going to do, amen. Uh, we've anointed these this morning. We're going to pray over this box just like we did the others, and then Steve and will take them up, and, and they'll pass them around. So I want you to join in agreement with me this morning. Just put your hands forward, and let's pray over these cloths. Father God, these cloths are just like in the Bible, in the book of Acts, cloths off the body of Paul, when people touched them, they were healed. And Father, these cloths are being prayed over and anointed by the body of Christ. And we believe by faith that just as those cloths produced healing and health upon people when they received them in faith, that these cloths, when people receive them, and Father, they feel them and they just, by faith, receive your healing power through their bodies, that COVID would be gone from their midst, that they'd be restored. And, Father, we thank you, Father, that in the name of Jesus Christ and because we're his body, that people receive healing and health through these cloths. We thank it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Steve, you want to go ahead and take these. Thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Let's begin with our scriptures today. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covers his sins... He that covers his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Isaiah 58, 1, this is in the Living Bible. Shout with a voice or a trumpet blast, tell my people of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and are so delighted to hear the reading of my laws just as though they would obey them just as though they don't despise the commandments of their God, how anxious they are to worship correctly, or how they love the temple services. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? Why don't you see our sacrifices? Why don't you hear our prayers? We have done much penance, and you don't even notice it. I'll tell you why. Because you're living in evil pleasure even while you're fasting, and you keep right on oppressing your workers. Verse 4. Look, what good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Listen now, the Lord isn't too weak to save you. And he isn't getting deaf. He can hear when you call. But the trouble is that your sins have cut you off from God. Because of sin, he has turned his face away from you and will not listen anymore. Jeremiah 5, 25. And so I have taken away these wondrous blessings from you. And so I have taken away these wondrous blessings from you. This sin has robbed them of all these good things. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. 
James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to ask Billy Ray if he would to bless the word this morning. Amen, amen. Let me paraphrase Isaiah 58, 1, 2 a little bit better, but in my translation. Basically, these people were coming to the gathering to hear God's commandments to be read to them. They acted like, man, they were gung-ho. They really enjoyed hearing him telling them what they should do and they shouldn't do. And just acted like, well, as soon as they got out, they were going to go do them. When the reality is, as soon as they left that meeting, they went and did just the opposite of what God told them not to do. And as a result of that, he tells them in Isaiah 59, verses 1-2, he says, as a result of sin, I will turn my face from you, and I will not listen to your prayers. You know, when you take this group of people in Isaiah 58, verse 1-2, through 2, it sounds a lot like a lot of Christians nowadays. They come to church on Sunday morning. Oh, we'd love to be here. We're going to worship God. And they'll get up all oh, that Bible. That's the Word of God. You do what it says. And as soon as they walk out of that service, you can't tell them the difference between them and the world. You know, if I'm not careful, I get to where I only preach about the goodness and the mercy of God, and I leave off the judgment of God. It's about like a doctor that writes you a prescription and never tells you the side effects. He'll get you in trouble if you're not real careful. God is a God of love, but he is also a God of judgment. Amen. Hebrews 10.31 says, fearful, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That should make every one of us, you know, be cautious of what we say and what we do. Vance Havner is a great man of God, and he makes a couple of these statements. He says, the church has developed a pleasant tolerance of everything today, and it is thought a mark of Christian love to not be against anything. You know, well, God's a God of love, you know. We do not have in the Christian community a true hatred of sin. We do not see sin as an awful thing that costs God his son and Jesus his life. And never has Satan scored a greater victory than in leading so much of the church to tolerate what God condemns and put up with what God would put out. Don't ever forget God is a holy God. In churches nowadays, we want feel-good messages, messages that will tickle our flesh and everything. And most people's attitude, if they go to church, if you bring me under conviction about my sin, I'll go somewhere else. I'll find somewhere else to go. And as a result of that, we're seeing things within the church I never would have believed. I mean, we're actually seeing within the Christian community, mainline denominations, there are ordination of homosexual, homosexuals in the pulpits and so forth. Never dreamed in my wildest imagination you would ever see that the Christian community would tolerate it. And not only that, we see things taking place within some of the church buildings and so forth. It may not be a sin, but it is when it's in the house of God. You know, there are certain things that if I go to someone's house, uh, someone else's house, I respect them enough, I wouldn't do those things. And we need to have that same attitude towards God in his house. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this, the judgment of God is just as real as his goodness. The judgment of God is just as good, real as his goodness. And sadly, we've come to a point we no longer fear the wrath of God. You know, my dad was a loving and a kind man. Couldn't beat him for a father. But I also tell you this, I experienced his wrath a time or two. And it wasn't a wild-eyed fury, but it was an application of backside psychology. And I didn't need, I can nearly tell you to this day, the five or six times my dad ever busted me and my brother. But when he did it, he didn't peck at you. He did it right. 
you didn't forget, you didn't walk away from her, I want some more of it, you know. So I know what it is to, to experience the wrath of a loving father. You know, I think one reason we see so much crime in this nation today is because of our court systems. There's no justice. There's really no punishment. Laws are mocked and, and we hand out short sentences. You know, it seems like today's society, the court systems, are more concerned about the criminal than they are the victim. I never will forget, I was listening to Bill O'Reilly one night, and he was on a crusade because there was a judge who gave a short sentence of 60 days to a man from molesting a young girl. And then you can't understand why crime's running rampant. You know, you need to read in the Old Testament how God dealt with lawbreakers. God believed in the death penalty. No doubt about it. He believed in young people respecting their elders. They had, they had uh, stone parties back then, not what you call nowadays. But if you didn't do what you were supposed to, you didn't respect your elders and so forth, they'd take you outside and they'd throw stones at you till it's all over with. You can rest assured of this. God's word means what it says. And his laws will not be broken without a price being paid. And I believe much of the moral decay, the crime, the violence, and the financial decline we have in America today is a result of mocking God in the Christian community, the tolerance of sin within the Christian community. Back in 2014, less than 50% of couples were married. And then they're growing, their children are growing up in that atmosphere. So many children nowadays are growing up in households without fathers. And the only way that we're going to ever see things change in this nation is if we have a national revival. And as a nation, we repent and we return to the Most High God, to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Yes. It's the only way that we're going to see things change. As Christians, we need to start taking a stand. One person, one home, one church, one community at a time. Y'all need some help? Yeah. Okay. Let's just pray right quick. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke and bind any spirits of illness or darkness that's come against this sister. And in Jesus' name, be gone, be gone, be healed and whole in Jesus' name. Do what? Uh, Acts 287 Access Road, all on it. Yeah. I've,
You okay, Linda? Amen. Amen. Back to the message. I'm going to tell you, saints, we need to start taking stand, one person, one home, one church, one community at a time. We need to start taking a stand over a lot of the movies, the TV shows that many Christians walk. Because I'm telling you this, they won't produce those if there's not any money in them. If the Christians aren't watching them too, there's no money in them. The vast majority of the things that are on TV nowadays are trash. When John Wayne passed away, that ended an era, I promise you that. <laughs> and here's what I can't understand. There ain't anybody I think would put up for anybody walking in your house and dumping a sack of trash in your living room. Yet you'll turn that stupid idiot box on and let stuff in your home that's a lot worse than any trash they dump in your floor. We have stood up as churches and have failed to take a stand against things like Harry Potter. In the Old Testament, they put witches and warlocks to death. And God didn't all of a sudden think, well, that's fine. It's a cute little old story about these kids and so forth. All it is is a precursor to allowing you to become unsensitive to what's going on. There are many Christians that sit around and their life revolve around the soap operas. I never will forget years ago, my dad was in dairy business there in Bowie, and every day after lunch, he and another guy there had a dairy. And they'd meet over to the little wheaten place over and talk about the soap operas, you know. And, and there's some, I mean, there are some people that have soap opera characters put on the prayer list, you know. But you watch that stuff. And Oprah Winfrey, and I'm going to tell you this, she is bad. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because she's a loving, good woman, but the things she views are so ungodly, it's pathetic. When you begin to tell people there are other ways to God than Jesus Christ, you're leading them straight down the pits of hell. Now we're going to get those that watch Survivors and that other stuff, you know. Pure trash, pure trash. And Yellowstone, I said it last Sunday, and I'm going to say it today. It is nothing but trash. They can label it however they want, and when you watch that stuff, you're endorsing it. We need to take a stand on the things we read. Years ago, I had a subscription to the AARP magazine because when you subscribe to the AARP, they have certain benefits and, and, and more than paid. And then their monthly magazine come out, and it said it had Elton John on there and how he was going to headline their convention. I found out it's a liberal magazine with liberal views. And I called and canceled my subscription. I don't need the benefits that bad. If you don't believe in God's judgment, that it's not a New Testament teaching. You need to read Revelation when God finally gets his belly full. And I'm telling you, it's real close. I heard a man preach this morning. He gave it point by point on how close we are the end times. And he said, I will never experience death. I believe that with all my heart. And he was an elderly man. The title of today's message is this. Sin robs you of God's blessings. I'm not trying to pass judgment on anybody. I'm not trying to do anything other than to get you to a point to where God can bless you. You don't get by with sin because sin shuts off God's blessings. Proverbs 28, 13, he that covers his sin shall not prosper. Now that's either true or it's not. Either true or it's not. We just read in Isaiah 59, 1, 2 that sin separated them from God. And he says, because of your sin, I will turn my face. I'm going to tell you right up front, sin breaks fellowship with God. And I'm going to make a statement right now. It doesn't break sin, necessarily break relationship. There are two teachings. They got one on this side, one saved, always saved. You basically walk down the aisle, do like you want to the rest of your life, and you're going to heaven. You got on the end out here, those that, well, you fall from grace. Every time you sin, you fall from grace. You know where the truth is? Right in the middle. Bill McCaleb always told me, he said, Larry, keep it in the middle. And if you'll take both those teachings and put them in the middle, you'll understand. No, you're not going to fall from grace every time you commit some sin. But don't, if you think you can walk down the aisle and accept Jesus and then 
live for the devil the rest of your life and go to heaven. You get you a fire suit and you go for it. You go for it. Look at the Bible. When Eve sinned, Adam was just as much of it as she was. He just tried to make excuses. Well, God, this woman you gave me. And that's why most people do. They want to make excuse for their sin. But when they sin, one sin, up to that point, God met them. He walked with them. They enjoyed his presence and everything else. One sin, and they lost that. No longer was he in their presence. And they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Jesus, if you don't think sin's real, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and our sins were being put upon his body. He's paying the price for mine and your sins. And it said God turned his face from him. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are you having trouble getting your prayers answered? Is there sin in your life? I'll tell you what, it's a good place to start. Do a self-check. You know, to me, it's like this. Your child, if they're out here and they're disobeying you and doing what they're not, you're telling them not to, are you just going to bless them continuously? I don't know about you, but I'm going to yank the financial support. I'm going to yank the blessing if they're doing what I told them not to do. And God's no different. There are no little sins and no big sins. James five sixteen says, The prayer of a righteous man avails much. The prayer of a righteous man could even move nature, cause it to rain or not to rain. I also tell you today that sin can trap anyone. You don't ever get past the point that you don't susceptible to sin. So you have to be on a constant guard. That's the danger of allowing little sins in your life. Before too long, they become big sins. I watched a documentary the other night on Jim Baker PTL. I mean, major, major probably the biggest Christian uh, ministry in the world and that sin brought it down crashing down jimmy swagger and i like jimmy swagger i'll, I'll tell you what I, he's still today but every time i see him today and i watch him some i can't help but think of what he did brought that mighty man of god down so don't you think you can't let sin bring you down whatever you're doing and just because a preacher man of god allows it endorses it it doesn't mean it's right because God's word is always to be your final authority. An example we have in the body is David. David had riches beyond measure. Had honor. Had more wives than you shake a stick at. I never did figure out why man needs more than one. Amen. Me and you better speak up. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> had a harem. Had all there was. What's the message? You'll never have enough to satisfy the flesh. It's going to always want more. going to always want this. That's why so many of us are overweight. Because we go beyond what we need. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, we have a story about Bathsheba. And first of all, we find out about her that she was beautiful. And Satan always disguises himself as a pretty picture, something that will give you pleasure, make you feel good, make you smarter, make you prettier. You look at the billboard, the ads, and it always has the beautiful people. You never see an ugly person holding a beer, smoking a cigarette, or wearing revealing clothes. It's always the beautiful people, the hip people. But those billboards never show the end results of those ads. It doesn't show the drug addict that's living a wasted life, their body deteriorating. They don't show the alcoholic with mangled bodies, broken homes, and careers wasted. It doesn't show those that are smoking, lying in a hospital bed, gasping for air, dying of cancer. It doesn't show those that, that wore the sexy clothes that experienced unwanted pregnancy, abortions, STD, and AIDS. See, it always addresses itself sin as something nice, something pretty, something you desire. And that's what Bathsheba was. Bathsheba's like a lot of Christians. In verse 4, it says she was purifying herself. It was that woman's time of the month, and the law required a purification rite at that. So therefore, she was a keeper of the law. In the eyes of most of people, well, she's a godly woman. But if you examine further, she had no morality. She knew David could see her. 
They didn't have binoculars and telescopes, and she was up on the rooftop in plain view. You know, a lot of Christians are like that today. Oh, they look good on the surface. They talk a good talk. They're at church on Sunday morning and maybe Wednesday night. But what about when no one is around? How many Christian men nowadays are, are pulling up porn on their phones and so forth, on their computers? Now, nobody sees it. Well, Jesus does. God does. But they tell me the sad part about this is even the viewing of porn is, is pervaded in a lot of preachers. Boy, that's, that's sad. I mean, that's sad commentary on how far we've got. Then we look at David, this great man of God. His sin, his downfall began with his refusal to resist temptation. The word says, resist the devil and he will flee. Listen, he could have looked away. Just like you can turn off those TV shows. You can refuse to go to those movies. But he began to entertain thoughts of adultery. Began to rationalize how it was okay. I'm king. No one will know. It's just going to be a one-time deal. And I can't resist that. How many times do you let Satan rationalize your sin is okay? And then you act on that rationalizing and you engage in the sin itself. Sin will always keep dragging you down just like a cancer spreads. And that's what sin is. It's a cancer in your life, in your spirit. And you either get rid of the cancer or it's going to get rid of you. That's the way it works. As a result of David not resisting sin, he engages with adultery with Bathsheba. And I imagine in his mind he thought, well, it's over with. I got away with it. There's no going to be no price to pay. No one's ever going to know. You know what? Some of you here today think you're getting away with sins in your life. You think everything's fine, everything's okay. And then he hears from Bathsheba, and she says, I'm pregnant. What does David do? He does what so many do when God convicts them of sin in their life. Instead of confessing and repenting, we justify it and we try to cover it up. David kept trying to cover this sin up and it went from adultery to deception to drunkenness to murder. This kept getting worse and worse. And sin will always be brought out and dealt with. You can be sure of that. I might not see it. Nobody else see it, but God saw it. I'll tell you a good gauge. If you're sitting in your home and you're going to watch something, you just get a picture of Jesus sitting there next to you and see if he, you want him to see it too. And a, just a little side note, he's there. His sin resulted in Uriah's death. And I imagine when he heard that, he thought, my problem's over. No one's ever going to know my pride's preserved. And then one day, <clears throat> man of God walks in, Nathan. And he begins by telling David this story. He said about this rich man who had a visitor. Instead of the rich man taking one of his lambs and slaying it to feed the visitor, he goes over and he takes this poor man that only has one lamb that's a pet of the family, and he takes that poor man's lamb and uses it to feed his visitor. David just gets angry. It just show me who it is, and I'll take care of him, you know. And then Nathan points his long, bony finger at David, and he says, you're the man. You're the man. Listen, God doesn't find out about your sin when you decide to tell him. One of the greatest tragedies in David's sin and others was innocent. People paid a price. Uriah dies. David and Bathsheba's first son dies. Absalom, David's older son, he dies. It's much like the story of Elijah and his servant. When he, when he goes and he, the Gazah, I believe is how you pronounce it. And he goes, uh, Elijah had told the man, he said, you're healed. You're not going to give me anything. Don't want anything from me whatsoever. And he leaves. So Gazah, Gazah I believe is how you pronounce it, says, he runs when he gets out of the distance and catches him and says, I'll take it. And as a result, he and his family experienced leprosy. Your sin will cause you problems. 
And sadly, your sins can lead your family and your friends astray. Why? It's because your kids will do what they see you do. You know, I'm amazed at parents that send their kids to Sunday school. We have them on two hours and they expect us to make saints out of them. What can you do? If you've got any sin in your life, it's confess and repent it. You may have to pay a price for it in the flesh. I mean, if you murdered somebody, you can confess the sin to God and repent of it, but you still may have to go to prison. You know, one day I was watching on TV a testimony of a young lady. She grew up in a Christian home, had high values, and went off to college and began associating with a crowd there in college. And they talked her in going to spring break. She goes to spring break, and this lady, this young girl had never, she's given a testimony, never drank anything in her life. When her friends kept after her, she began to drink a beer and then another beer. After a couple of beers, she got drunk, and she had sex with a boy one time, and she contracted AIDS, and she said, my life is over. My life is over. It's the price of sin. The word says the prayer of a righteous man avails much. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we will confess our sins and cleanse us, it will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 1, 18 said, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what's went on. You can leave here this morning as pure as snow, cleansed from all unrighteousness. The beautiful thing about the Bible, it's a book of new beginnings. And if you made mistakes, have you allowed sin in your life, little or big, no difference? Confess it, repent it, and then forget it. Paul says in Philippians 3, 13, 14, forgetting those things in the past. And when Satan tries to bring it up, you just tell him, say, Satan, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. Jesus Christ paid the price for that. I believe we're going to see some things in people's lives. If we don't see some changes in this nation, it, it, it's, getting, it's getting scary, I'll be honest with you, for our kids, our grandkids. But I'm going to tell you once again, it's going to happen when we do it as individuals. I can't control what everybody else does. I can't control what goes in my life and what goes on. We can control what goes on in this church. We can't control what goes in other churches. But it begins with one person one individual, one church, one community that's willing to take a stand for God and say, you know what? God says that's wrong, and I refuse to engage in it. And I believe that will happen as we have a cleansing process. When we have that process to where when you sin, you know, you're not going to box your kid around because they make a mistake or they do something bad. If it's continuously, they're going to pay a price for it. But we have a cleansing process when we confess and repent of our sin and say, you know, God, I missed it. Every, every time, well, you need to have a sensitive spirit. Say, I missed it. I ask you to forgive me, and I won't do it again. And I also understand this. Once again, there's no little sin, no big sin. You say, well, I'm, I'm not terrible. Have you gossiped about somebody, talked about your brothers, sisters in Christ? How about backbiting? Have you said bad things about each other, about others? How about unforgiveness? I think probably next to sin, the number one major reason our prayers are not answered is unforgiveness. Do you understand doubt and unbelief of sin? Worries of sin? Witchcrafts of sin? The things that we watch and attend and endorse, a lot of those are sins, pure and simple. Do you view porn, phones, computers? Any sex outside of marriage, I don't care what the people say. Well, you just got to be more tolerant, Brother Larry. Hey, listen, I'm not your judge. Don't make, doesn't think one less of anybody, but God's the judge. His word is your judge. Maybe you're saying you have other gods in your life. Anything that you have in your life that's keeping you from selling out to God and serving God's a sin. It's an idol in the eyes of God. Hobbies, jobs, 
Once again, as I've seen people over the years that have just got bogged down in past mistakes, and they've allowed a sin in their life to hold them in bondage. You can't change yesterday, but you can change tomorrow. And you can be forgiven and forgotten. That's the way it works with God. Some people say, well, I just don't have sin in my life. Then you have a sin of pride. You have a sin of pride. What I'm going to ask you to do this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand. Every head bowed and eye closed. And this is between you and God. It's not between anybody else. It's between you and God. And, and he's not going to find out when you decide to own up to it. But you can say, you know, Brother Larry, I've just allowed some things. I'm not saying they're real bad things, but I've just allowed some things in my life. And this morning, I'm going to ask God to forgive me of them. Just slip your hand up. I see those hands. Amen, amen, all over, all over. Father, these people today have confessed things in their life that just weren't right, that were against your word, and they confessed them this morning. And right now, they ask you to forgive them. Just, just silently just say, Father, forgive me that sin and give me the ability to not do it again. Father, your word says that they leave here this morning, each one of these people, cleansed from all unrighteousness, that their prayers will be effective, and, Father, your blessings will once again flow into their life. And, Father, we, forg we thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for our sins and never let us take it lightly, but always just be sensitive that we never get to a point that sin doesn't bother us that we want to live a life that is pleasing and honorable to you, a life that allows your blessings to flow through us and through our families. And we do this in Jesus' name and all God's children said. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed and eye closed. There's someone here this morning, and God showed me this a couple of days ago. It's, it's in your right-hand side of your back. And I don't think it's just a pain. I think there's a growth or something there, and it may be Facebook or here. It may be diagnosed, I don't know, but there's a growth or a tumor. And right now, in the name of Jesus, it's healed. It's gone in Jesus Christ's name. Just a few more moments. I appreciate you this morning. These are not, I'm a whole lot more comfortable preaching the good things of God. But people, if sin shuts us off from the good things of God, I can preach about all I want to. And we get insensitive sometimes. We allow things to happen, and it shouldn't be. You know, it shouldn't be. And we need to start taking a stand. That's the reason this nation's in the trouble it's in today. It, it's not the lost. It's a Christian that won't take a stand and say, that's, that's not right, that, that's not going to work. And it's the churches that won't take a stand. And we, we've got to where we want to be acceptable to the community. God, the world has never accepted Christianity or godly lifestyle. So it's something we need to be cautious about. We need to be sensitive to. Now, does we have to go around with a holier-than-our attitude? No. Do we have to be scared to death we're going to commit a sin and lose our salvation? No. No. But we need to be sure that we take care. When it happens, confess it, repent it, forget it. Go on. Go on. And thank God. When, every time, it, the, the less, here's the problem. The less the church preaches and teaches about sin, then the less Jesus' sacrifice means. The less his sacrifice means. The more that you view sin as is, is abomination to God, then Jesus' sacrifice means more and more. I don't want anybody to leave here this morning under condemnation because Jesus paid the price for your sins. And, and I don't care what you've done yesterday or in the past. It's gone. It's forgotten. It's under the blood. So everybody here this morning should walk out of here with a, 
a spring in your step, a smile on your face, and knowing that you've just opened the pipeline for God's blessings to begin to flow out upon you and upon your family and your loved ones. And that's what today's message is all about. I appreciate each one of you being here today. Don't forget our singing tonight at 6 o'clock. If you can't be here, view you in on Facebook. Once again, we appreciate our Facebook viewers. I have several people. Seems like every week tell me, well, well we, we're not coming, but we're watching you on Facebook, you know. It's maybe the one tool that Satan's taking that God can use for his benefit and his glory. So I'll give him the credit for that, credit for that. We love you. We appreciate you. Uh, invite Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. I encourage you to come to be with that. I'm going to ask Steve Neese if he would to dismiss us in prayer.